I'll give this a they chance. They say it's not about what you know, it's about who you know. And if you happen to befriend Adam Sandler between 1984 and 1994, you would likely have a multi-billion dollar box office resume. In this 10 year stretch, Adam basically met everyone he would end up working closely with on films for the rest of his 30 year career. This group helped Sandler dominate Hollywood, whether they were writing, producing, directing, or sharing the screen with him. You could argue that Adam Sandler does not like making new friends. The only people added to the Sandler version in the 2000s were Nick Swardson and Kevin James. And yeah, Adam is definitely a good guy, helping his buddy stay employed all these years, but he also needs them more than you realize. Comedy and this cinema fans squad, have been debating on whether or not Adam Sandler is funny since the 80s. However, even he knew he wasn't that okay, funny, just which is why he carefully I'm crafted an I, army of yes men who were great at making Adam Sandler films, but wouldn't find much success without him. The real reason why Adam exploded into superstardom is actually more mysterious mysterious than you'd think. Today we are going to take a closer look into the Sandler squad who helped hey, him build tired, a Hollywood yeah. mediocre movie machine. That machine would lead to one of the most debated legacies of all time. What keeps you in the game? It seems oh, almost- Oh man, I, I, I was so crazy when I was young. I just thought like, yeah, I'm gonna be huge. I'm gonna be, I'm so psychotic. <laughs> Delusion. The dream of becoming a Hollywood star is often shut down by the people Thanks around the you. They will call you crazy. You're never gonna make it, they'd say. Adam was delusional. But that's exactly what you need to be to succeed. From the moment he decided to be a comedian at age 17, he convinced as many people as he could to believe in his delusional dream. Adam arrived at New York University's Tisch School of the Arts in 1984, where he would be surrounded by thousands of other students pursuing artistic careers. His roommate, Tim Herlihy, would be the very first member of the Chad, similar dream. Chad, he's one of the only actors I feel like it. I think his speech, his demeanor fits his looks like one to one. It's like a perfect cohesion. You know, I don't think he's the best actor. I think with the tool set that he has and what he looks like, it's like it just flows. Team. Tim would go on to write Billy Madison, Happy Gilmore, The Wedding Singer, The Waterboy, Mr. Deeds, Bedtime Stories, Pixels, Hubie Halloween, as well as working on multiple other Adam Sandler productions. Tim has also made his fair share of on-screen cameos, like the fireman in Mr. Deeds, or the bouncing kangaroo in Big Daddy. Uncle Jem sucks. I watched it again recently. Shit's garbage. I like too hot, hot, hot. Every single creation that Tim has acted or produced in his entire career was for Sandler, which makes sense because he never intended on being in Hollywood. Tim Herlihy was actually an accountant, pursuing a law degree, and was never considered by his friends and family to be funny, but he was enamored by Adam's charisma. Guys, Tim said he was- I'll go into this is good, okay? The movie is good. I like the tense, the environment it creates. The problem that some things just, sometimes they just kind of don't make sense in the way that they go. And it just feels clunky, especially with the um, with the uh, dialogue in it. From like the like the rapper gonna like come out of spot, like, oh yo yo yo, I need my rock, man. Yo, where is my rock, bro? It just feels clunky. It was extremely the outgoing, is good, though. his mouth going a mile a minute, and funny and all over the place. It was kind of a sight to behold. As a fun hobby, Tim began writing jokes for Adam's stand-up comedy in their Britney Hall dorm room. Adam would practice his one-liners to strangers in front of the coffee shop below his living quarters. As he got more confidence, he started hustling at comedy clubs, pips, and catch a rising- Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Not the fucking- Oh my god. There's a rapper and an NBA player, there's both. Chill the fuck out, man. There's fucking The Weeknd and KG or whatever. Okay, oh my. Oh, it's Antony Fontana moment, guys. Every guy's a ra rapper. There's two of them. They, they, like, chill out, chill out star, but Adam and Tim were not funny enough to consistently get laughs from the comedy club crowd, so they decided to recruit another member to the Sandler squad to help write more material. Adam became intrigued by a young man called Frank Karachi who lived down the hall. Uh... Adam said, at NYU he always frosted his hair. He had a mohawk. Girls loved him. He went to dance Terry a lot. He went to a lot of cool clubs. He was the lord of the 80s. Frank aspired to write and direct films. He made short films in college and often had Adam star in them. He was the first person to direct Adam Sandler on a video production. Frank would go on to direct The Wedding Singer, The Water Boy, Click, Zookeeper, Here Comes the Boom, Blended, and The Ridiculous Six. In fact, the 
the only movies Frank Karachi directed for the first 20 years were Sandler's projects. Frank recently stopped working with Sandler and just released his most critically acclaimed film of his entire career. Perhaps instead of goofy comedies, biographical documentaries were always his calling, and maybe working with Sandler was holding him back. Then again, if Sandler didn't consistently hire Frank to be his director, he might not have had a career to begin with. Plus, Adam and the gang love to portray wacky side characters. And it's not because the chat disagrees, it's just because people are making conclusions that are just really weird. That are just, they're just really weird and they're trying to reach and make everything always about race and racist and shit like that and trying to twist the words and narratives. It's just fucking weird. It, you know exactly what I meant and you're just being annoying for no, it's, I, I don't like defending myself against delusion and stupidity because it gives life to that. Now shut up please, I'm trying to watch this shit man. Where would we be without Frank's portrayal of Bobby Boucher's dad, Roberto? Bobby, it's me, your daddy, Roberto. Daddy? You know, I seen you on the ESPN when they was talking about you being drafted by the NFL. Adam's routine in 1985 would be going to a comedy club on Monday, absolutely bomb, come back to the dorms and revise his material with Tim and Frank, and by Friday have figured out a way to make it better. His comedic persona was the everyman who makes relatable jokes here. enhanced with silly voices. I can talk about wet dreams. You know, I'm a young. I, I, wet dreams kind of ruined my whole life, you know? There's only so many times you can tell your mother you lost your underwear. Every NYC comic in the 80s knew to get recognized you had to perform at the comic strip. Comedy legends such as Larry David, Jerry Seinfeld, and Robin Williams were a few of the many that laid their comedic foundations here. Adam was able to land himself an audition well, and immediately impress the booking agent, Lucien Hold. He was only 19 years old and I signed him up immediately. He had all clean stuff, very quirky, very cute. I thought, this guy is really good. It's interesting that Lucien described Sandler with quirky and cute instead of funny. It's evident what? that Adam had star power, or it factor. And sometimes it factor is unexplainable. You either have it or you don't. You will notice this becomes a trend in Adam's career. All of his friends talk about how they had a gut feeling about Adam. It wasn't necessarily that he was the funniest, they just knew he could be a star. But Adam thought he sucked. I don't think I was, I'm not as sharp as some of the other guys that we grew up with. Like, mm -hmm. and, and I wasn't as prepared when things went off. In I other words, you, what? You didn't memorize your stuff? I you didn't tried to, but I would choke. I would choke. I would like, I would choke memorizing my jokes and I would panic and I would see stars and stuff and I was gulping up. Sandler admits he wasn't the best at stand-up, but he knew it was necessary for him to learn if he wanted to have a career in comedy, film, and television. Luckily, he would meet a new funny friend, one who actually had interest in pursuing a comedy career. Alan Covert sat next to him in a history of comedy class at NYU where they bonded over their love for the film Caddyshack. Adam invited Alan back to the Britney Hall dorms and locked him in with the team. I used to open up for him when we would do, he would do college tours doing stand-up and I was at an opening act which was, uh, it's a tough job. Yeah, why, why that, that? that well, looks dramatic. Sandler fans, they don't come to see just comedians. They come to see Sandler. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Dan, there's just nothing it, in the world like really standing good in 6,000 people, and before you even say a word, they just all scream, you suck! <laughs> they start a you suck chant. Yeah, the minute you walk on stage, the guy might as well have just said, ladies and gentlemen, a guy who's not Adam Sandler. <laughs> It was clear from the very beginning that Alan was always going to play the support role for Adam, whether it was on stage or on the screen. He created some extremely memorable characters like Ten Second Tom from Fifty First Dates, as well as the frowsy caddy in Happy Gilmore. Alright, give me a club. Oh, that, that, that's banging. Okay. But Covert always felt like he had to prove himself. Because back then, I was still like, Fighting, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like they yeah, had to yeah. go, like, no, 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 Covert's funny. Like, look, I had to grow that beard just yeah, to be yeah, happy. The crazy mullet I was everything. like, no, 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 it'll be good, it'll be good. I'm the guy, I don't have to talk. Just <laughs> let me be funny and look weird. And when Alan finally got his opportunity to be the main character in a Sandler film, he crushed it. Grandma's Boy, produced by Happy Madison Productions, was about a 35 year old stoner and video game tester who gets evicted and has to move in with his grandma and her two old lady roommates. The irreverent comedy only secured six million dollars in the box 
box office but was able to make over $30 million in DVD sales. The numbers seem small but they six times their investment, plus the Sandler fandom loved this Jesus. film just as much as other classics. This seems like an obvious sign that Covert had potential to be Jesus. a strong lead, but he only got one other lead role after this in the film Strange Wilderness. After that, he continued to take a backseat and play supporting roles, like in Grown Ups 2, Bedtime Stories, Just Go With It. You could even argue his role- Chat, guys, fuck, guys, I'm trying to not be a massive hater. I don't l like his acting. I, I don't like it. Um, I think it's it's really clunky. To take a backseat and play supporting roles, like, like in Grown Ups 2, Bedtime Stories, Just Go With It. You could even argue his roles became less significant over the years, but why? Maybe he didn't want to be a star. Maybe he just liked supporting his buddy. Or maybe there just wasn't enough room for Adam to shine while Alan was on screen. Considering he has producer credits on nearly every Sandler film he has acted in, maybe behind the scenes is where the team agreed he should be. Plus, he has a $12 million net worth, so... Whatever Adam says, eh? But Adam's grind and dedication to be great must not be understated. After securing his spot as a paid regular at the comic strip, he oh, would still Vikings, stand yeah. in the New York City subways performing covers of Beatles songs hoping to get tips from travelers. He got so confident with the guitar that he added it to his stand-up routine. In 1993, he signed a record deal with Warner Brothers. His debut comedy album, They're All Gonna Laugh At You, is actually two times platinum and was nominated for a Grammy. He even performed with a full band on his 1996 comedy tour heck? and has done countless singing performances throughout his career, with the most notable one being a song dedicated to his late friend Chris Farley. You know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about my friend Chris Farley. It was also during Adam's time at the comic strip that he met Chris Rock. Rock was fresh off his first Hollywood film and just getting established in the NYC comedy scene when Sandler arrived. Chris saw Adam's act and thought he was hilarious. And I'm watching him and he does this joke about uh, Wilt Chamberlain. Wilt Chamberlain once scored 100 points in a game. And Sandler does this joke, he goes, uh, here's my impression of the coach of the other team. Who's got Wilt? But Chris didn't become a part of Adam's team, because he was a star in his own right, with way too much potential to help someone else. As they developed their acts together at the comic strip, they gained support from the club's owner, Richie Tinkin. Richie introduced Adam to a talent manager named Barry Moss, who in 1987 was casting for The Cosby Show. Keep in mind, The Cosby Show was the highest viewed sitcom <laughs> on television for five years straight, averaging around 38 million views per episode. Adam auditioned and landed a small role as Smitty in just four episodes. From there, he secured a a consistent spot telling jokes on remote control, which was MTV's very first original non-musical program. You know, I went to New York last week and I had a great time, real good time. I had one of these tour guides who really thought he knew everything, and, but uh, he didn't know how to fly when I threw him off the Empire State Building. Ah! Remote Control also hosted college tours around the country where Adam was invited to perform stand-up. It was becoming somewhat of a micro-celebrity, occasionally being Jack, recognized on- Not one of the clips of any comedy skits in, in this entire thing actually even made me smile streets of New York City. Adam's resume was getting strong. He had a little bit of money saved up and got a taste of Hollywood, so he decided to move to Los Angeles to get that much closer to making it on the big screen. And on the West Coast, there was another small crew of comedians who were about to join the Sandler hype train. Rob Schneider was a few years older than Adam and had already been making noise in the comedy world. He just recently did a performance on David Letterman's Tonight Show, which was basically well, an early but... sign that you made it in the 80s. Schneider knew Adam was a buzzing comic, and even saw him and Chris Rock on the cover of a small comedy magazine called Comedy USA. So Rob was shocked this one evening funny. when he was performing a small LA show to see Adam Sandler take the stage. And I saw his first show out there and I was the only two people really, really laughing hard was me and him. Really? He, he was laughing at himself and I was laughing and uh, I took him out for a beer afterwards and I said, oh man, you're gonna be huge. Yet again, Adam was not dominating the crowd, but for some reason, another comic was immediately convinced he would be a star. Rob took him out for a beer after his set, and from there, he became a part of the Sandler network. Rob helping Adam would not be a waste, as he would create some I, of the I most memorable the, side characters the in the Sandlerverse, such as Ula in Fifty First Dates, the Minister in I Now Pronounce You Chuck and Larry, and of course, the Townie in The Waterboy. You can do it! Cut it. it hello. Head off. However, critics didn't think Schneider was all that special. Schneider received a nomination at the Golden Raspberry Awards for the worst supporting actor for his role as the delivery guy in Adam's most successful 90s movie, Big Daddy. In your experience, was Sonny a good father to Julian? Oh yes, the terrific pair. They went together like lamb and tuna fish. Lamb and tuna fish? 
Maybe like spaghetti and meatball. Sandler was the winner of the funny. Worst Actor Raspberry Award for this film and would go on to win nine more Golden Raspberries throughout his career. He basically gets nominated for Worst Actor every time he releases a movie. When the critics started hating me, uh, I, I really, I, I just felt bad for my family. I felt bad for the people who worked hard on the movies, you know, because <laughs> I mean, I had so many great actors in the movies and when we would get done shooting it, they would say to me, I think the critics are going to like this one. And I'd be like, oh, no, <laughs> no, they're going to say bad things and they're probably going to say bad things about you being in it. But Big Daddy was a $235 million blockbuster hit and Adam believed in Rob and he was learning to ignore the critics. They immediately bounced back with Rob as the lead in Deuce Bigelow, Male Gigolo, oh, I mean, which earned around $92 million massive. in the box office. But this would be the most profitable film with Rob as a lead. One by one, every film with Rob as a lead would bring a smaller return on investment. Investment. The Animal, The Hot Chick, Deuce Bigelow, European Gigolo, Benchwarmers. They kept the fandom satisfied, but none of them exploded in performance, leading Happy Madison, Adam's production company, to stop writing movies with Rob as the lead. Rob still believed in his capability of being a main character, but the two movies he released outside of Happy Madison's productions were utter failures, which kind of proves that without Sandler's team, he couldn't be successful. So he went back to playing support roles, which was fine until he wasn't invited to be in Grown Ups 2. Sandler's second most successful oh, film to date. You? They're doing Grown Ups 2 without me. Mistake. They should have paid me a lot of money. Well, truthfully, I wasn't sure if I'd have my TV series, so it was an availability thing. But at the end of the day, they should have said, what money does Rob need? Rob was Whoa. given five lead roles by Sandler and dozens of support roles over the years. Despite critics relentlessly trashing his work, Sandler still gave him as much opportunity as he could. The moment Adam well, didn't bend over okay. backwards for Schneider, he got angry and went to the media. This animosity led to Schneider not working with Sandler for years. They eventually mended their relationship in 2015 because Rob understood without Happy Madison, he wasn't finding success. Luckily, Sandler doesn't hold grudges because he never forgot how many favors Rob- Even out of context, it doesn't matter. Some things don't need context. Sometimes a phrase is just enough on its own you just don't put it like that. But it seems, I don't give a fuck about the context. I think it's just flat wrong. Rob did for him early it's on in his career. It's one of the rare things career. that is just flat wrong. Every one in this room tonight has made my life fun. People always would ask me, those bad reviews you get, how does that make you feel? Make you feel like shit? And I'd say, <laughs> nah, it really doesn't. I, I think the reason I, I get yeah. to say it, that didn't hurt me is because so many of you guys in this room made me feel great about what, what we've done together. And all my fellow comedians, actors, writers, collaborators, crew members, people on the streets, my family, my kids, my forever girl, Jackie, all make me feel like the critics didn't know what they, what the hell they were talking about. So thank you for all that. Schneider got Adam in at the improv in the late 80s, which was the hot club for upcoming comedians in LA. It, it's a fine line between that and like, I feel like, uh, like yes men and, and like, you know, like feel the delusion. But LA. at the that. improv, Adam befriended comedian Judd Apatow. They even got an apartment together. Adam's, Adam's the next Eddie Murphy. You just knew it even when he was bombing. It wasn't like he was killing on stage and you thought that as a result of the success of his performances. Right. We found him and know what's the crowds was hit and miss, but there was a certain charisma, which is the charisma which led to everything that happened that you felt when he was in his early 20s. If anything, hotter because he had so much energy as a friend to make you laugh because he wasn't making movies. So all that energy he that put into his career in the early days was just used on you. Shit, I think as an actor, Adam Sandler has like anti-charisma, which is like his flair, is it not? At dinner. <laughs> what you are starting to see is how valuable it is to keep people around you that believe in you. Adam has now developed a network of comics and writers who all uplifted him and knew he was hilarious yeah, despite crowds of comedy fans not seeing the magic. Ironically, Judd only worked with Sandler once in his career. He would go on to produce tons of movies that you probably think are way funnier than any of Sandler's films. Judd produced Anchorman, 40-Year-Old Virgin, Knocked Up, 
Superbad, Step Brothers, Pineapple Express, Bridesmaids, and many other comedy oh, classics. Maybe Judd had a higher standard for comedy and didn't like Sandler's vision for films. Or maybe he was just focused on creating his own legacy. But while Sandler and Judd were living in that LA apartment together, yeah, Adam's that. buddy from NYU, Jack Giraputo, crashed on their couch for three months after realizing he hated law school. Jack would go on to form Happy Madison Productions with Sandler and produce every single film Adam has ever created up until 2015 when he finally retired. But the other leader of the Sandlerverse entered Adam's life during his time at the Improv in the late 80s, David Spade. Spade was impressed with the same material that made Chris Rock a fan. So I'm gonna tell you one and what? you tell me if this is how it goes. Yes. You said, uh, well, you go, um, Wilt, Wilt Chamberlain scored 100 points in one game, which is true. Right? Oh, not goes, again. Hey, here's my impression of the, uh, his team in, in the timeout in the huddle. Hey, Wilt, I'm f***ing open, dude. Uh, <laughs> And then you go, here's the coach on the other team during the, the huddle. Who's covering Wilt? Uh, uh, yeah. uh, that stay was on it. him, I believe he's hot. That was, that's right. Yeah. I believe he's hot. I know, I used to get so excited to say that joke because it was one of the few that worked. It's interesting how a simple joke made some of the most promising comedians fully invested in Sandler. Aside from SNL, Dave's breakout role was alongside Chris Farley in the comedy Jack, classic Tommy. Jack, it has to be in, in like an inside joke, like you have to be there like at some bar or some shit. Like there's no way it, that is delivered like that. Hey boy, which is actually rated higher than Delivery any of Delivery is everything, Sandler's especially when you're Sandler. Films. They released another buddy comedy, Black Sheep, the following year. Spade bounced around from movies to TVs to animated films in the late 90s and didn't end up formally working with Adam until until 2001, where he was casted as the lead role in Joe Dirt, another Sandlerverse cult classic. Minutes. Throughout his career, Spade didn't want to ride the coattails of Adam. Around 2006, he started working with him more closely, taking support roles in Grandma's Boy, The Benchwarmers, and of course, Grown Ups, where the whole squad came together. But he has a wide resume of sitcom roles, the most notable being on Just Shoot Me and Rules of Engagement, both highly rated series. He also voiced various animated characters over the years, but the most popular was Cusco in Emperor's New Groove. He also voiced the video game character Sparks, who was Spyro's dragonfly friend. He even did various really? commercials and hosted award shows. Clearly, David Spade is the one man we all agree definitely would have been successful even if he wasn't Adam Sandler's friend. In fact, it's actually Adam who was lucky to be David Spade and Rob Schneider's friend, because they're the reason he got on Saturday Night Live in 1990. Comedian Dennis Miller was the anchor of SNL's Weekend Update segment. Weekend Update was their highest viewed program and at the time hosting it was an extremely coveted position in the comedy world. Miller scouted Spade and Schneider at the Improv and invited them to audition for SNL. They secured their spot as writers at the end of season 15 in 1990. Then Chris Rock and Chris Farley were added to the SNL team in season 16. With three of Sandler's comedy buddies advancing their careers in New York, Adam got a different opportunity to be the star in his very first film, Going Overboard. Looks cool. Going Overboard was about a bartender on a cruise ship who dreams of becoming a comedian. The movie never hit theaters and is considered by many to be the least funny film ever made. Luckily, his career would be <laughs> saved when Schneider, Spade, and Rock convinced the SNL casting director to give Sandler a shot. He moved back to New York City and was added to the writing team in December of 1990. Sandler shared a tiny office with Chris Rock, Chris Farley, and David Spade. The crew felt like they finally made it, but Schneider was the one standing out. He was the first giant on our show. Oh, we had, it was been a good time. Yeah. Dennis Miller used to walk around going, hey? the Schneid man hit. <laughs> and he kind of throw it in all our faces. Yeah. Like, what do you guys got to come up guys? with something? Yeah, yeah. Schneid man, that's Schneid all I hear man. about. The guys would write jokes specifically designed for them, as they often relied on physical comedy. With Farley being the overweight maniac and Adam portraying goofy characters with silly accents, it didn't hit the same when anyone besides Sandler Farley or Spade delivered the jokes. Why? Yes! <laughs> Landing a job on SNL is basically the best comedy cosign you can receive in the industry, so it becomes much easier to get business opportunities. Adam was landing movie roles left and right. He played Dink in the film Shakes the Clown, Carmine in Coneheads, then landed a primary role as Pip in Airheads. He met Steve Buscemi on the set of Airheads and would go on to cast Steve in over 10 films. Some of the fan favorite characters were the homeless man in Big Daddy or Crazy Eyes in Mr. Deeds. Great. Chat, this is chat. I find things that are unfunny more funny than funny things. I don't know what's going on with you, dude. What? Oh, yeah. <coughs> things that are so unfunny. Hey. I, it's hey. funny. How you doing, pal? I got your pizza for you just the way you like it. Oh, yes. 
French fries and Oreos. You know me all too well, Deeds. But there was one man that Adam Sandler <laughs> used as a go-to support role that ended up causing some major controversy. Peter Dante met Adam in 1992 while playing a game of one-on-one -on -one basketball at Gary Shandling's house. The two hit it off immediately. Peter would go on to have almost the exact same career path as Alan Covert, playing supporting roles and wacky side characters in various Happy Madison productions. He was the quarterback in The Waterboy. Watch where you're going, needle dick. The burnt out friend in Mr. Deeds. He even got to co-star with Alan in Grandma's Boy. It seemed like Dante was a go-to side character for Sandler all the way up until Rude. Grown Ups 2. During the filming of Grown Ups 2, Adam made Peter live dickhead. within a mile of him so, so they could play basketball every day, which was often three times per Yo, day. I don't give a fuck, but one major I am needle dick, but I'm 6'2. I got a I got a real long needle. What about it? What about it? Their mistake would end their friendship forever. In 2013, just after Grown Ups 2 released, Dante was checking into the JW Marriott Hotel in Santa Monica. According to the police report, the actor grew upset because he wanted a new room key and What's was not this? happy that staffers didn't recognize him as an actor. He then proceeded to call the black staff member the N-word as well as the F-slur, as well as lashing out at a Mexican valet worker saying, Do you know where you are? We don't need you. Someone from TMZ saw Dante well, strolling the streets days it. later and asked him about his belligerent antics. At least according to this guy. <laughs> my to you. He's gonna list all of his black friends for us. I know what you're doing as a T.I. was gonna hold what? Ask my black, ask Marcus Camby about me. After doubling down on his racist remark. Ask my black, ask Marcus Camby about me. After doubling down on his racist remarks, he never worked in another Adam Sandler film ever again. For the past 10 years, Dante has been Could living the highlight, seemingly poorly. strung out on drugs and alcohol as the lead singer of a failing reggae band performing dive bars in Southern California. His real life today is the exact persona depicted in his most popular film, Grandma's Boy. But Adam's comedic persona that he created on SNL in the 90s laid the foundation for his film career. Hey, uh, canteen boy, can I help you with something? Uh, not right now, Mr. McGrath. Just get myself situated. Oh, well, you know, I wouldn't want to rush you, canteen boy, because uh, you're one crazy, wild man. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Hello. Let me water your plants. <laughs> Please, while you're gone, let me water your plants. Go as Smiley Boy. Hey, I'm Smiley Boy. Look at me. I got a big smile on my face. Now give me some candy. Turkey, turkey, D. Turkey, turkey, dap. I eat the turkey and I take a nap. Adam met Tim Meadows in 1993, <laughs> who would go on to feature and a handful of Happy Madison productions. By 93 and 94, Adam was now a permanent on-screen talent on SNL and even recruited his first Sandler Squad member, Tim oh, Hurley, to so write funny. for the show. But some people, like Bill Murray, hated Adam's SNL material. Bill Murray was an SNL veteran, returning in 1993 to host, oh, and wasn't very happy with the material he was seeing. Which Bill Murray are you gonna get? The nice Bill Murray? <laughs> you gonna get the tough Bill Murray. Yeah. You know, he's super nice to fans. He wasn't very nice to us. Interesting. He hated us on Saturday Night Live when he hosted. He did. Wow. Absolutely hated us. Seething. Saturday Night Live season 20, which was the last season dominated by the Sandler crew, is up for debate as the worst season in the show's history. Because of the low ratings, NBC threatened to fire Lorne Michaels, who created and produced SNL since 1975. Sandler thought he was crushing it. I mean, him and his buddies thought the show was funny, but nobody else did, and it reflected in the viewership. SNL needed a fresh reset, so they fired Adam, Farley, Schneider, and Spade the following year. Yeah, I was fired. I was fired. NBC said that I was done. Then I made over four billion dollars at the box office. <laughs> so I guess you could say I won. <laughs> Billy Madison released two months before Adam was fired from SNL. This was his first movie released through his own production company and secured a $16 million profit at the box 62. office. Not only that, but the film became a cult classic, a part of American comedy culture. Getting fired from SNL was the best thing to ever happen to Adam Sandler. It was now 1995, he had momentum after a banger film, and had a network of more than a dozen comedians, writers, and actors who believed in his vision. Was there a pivot point in your career where you just, you just knew, this is it, it's go time. Um, that's that's a good one, Nicky. Uh, I, I, 
Billy Madison. Billy Madison is when we started going. I didn't watch his video. No, it's brand new. It just, it just came we out. We all got together and we we're like, let's 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 do what we we think is funny. Yeah. And um and then we didn't stop doing it together and we made a bunch of movies together. Yeah. From there, his process was very simple. Here's how I think of my scripts, Sandler jokes. I sit in my room, I think up an idea, then I call up all my friends and they say, that's awesome, you're the best. Although he was kidding here, this isn't really far from the truth. Adam is a true testament of how valuable being a leader is. He is also the product of someone who had friends who deeply cared about him and believed in him when he had nothing. Instead of leaving those people in the dust, he designed his whole career around them, Chat, making yeah, sure that they- I don't think they're yes men. I think maybe they understand that the way he sees something and how it's going to be delivered, only him can see it because he's the one writing it or whatever, right? And they kind of trust like that vision, I feel like. Because, yes or not, Chad, you can have the best, most funniest joke, the delivery still matters a lot. They were able to stay employed by creating formulaic comedy films with bizarre and he's plots, all delivery. stupid side characters, screaming, dad jokes, silly songs, then rinse and repeat for 30 years. And yeah, sure, critics hated basically all of his films, but he doesn't have to listen to your criticism because he doesn't operate in your standards of quality. He clearly is a much better actor when pursuing serious roles, such as Punch Drunk Love and Uncut Gems, yet he still doesn't care that critics are finally starting to praise his acting. He probably is only pursuing this next dramatic role in Spaceman because he knows comedy films are dead these days. Some people think Adam just surrounded himself with yes men, hacky comics who had nothing going for them so they latched onto their golden ticket in Hollywood. And I'm not gonna lie, his early stand-up and most of the stuff that was on SNL, I probably wouldn't have seen the Adam Sandler hype. But they clearly saw something in him that we didn't and they were right. He made $4 billion making silly movies with his best friends and family while traveling around the world. It seems like he lived the perfect life. Uncut Gems. Uh... Um... It's, it's, it's medium. 